right, hi everyone. Today we're gonna to be wrapping up our studies on ancient China with achievements of ancient China. So some big developments uh, that came out of the Han Dynasty mostly, um, and how those things have influenced other areas of the world. So we're going to start with the Silk Road. Uh, the Silk Road was an ancient trade route between China and Europe uh, that developed as the Chinese empires were expanding. Um, we talked about the Qin Dynasty and the Han Dynasty. And as those dynasties expanded their territory, uh, mostly further to the west, they came into contact with other societies in Central Asia and beyond. And so they were able to link up with those other cultures uh, and create these trade routes. Um, and trade introduced new food, new goods, and new ideas to uh, China and Chinese ideas and things to other parts of the world. We'll talk about those. The Silk Road was officially established by Han Wudi, who was our warrior emperor in the Han Dynasty. And he connected the already existing roads, bridges, and trade routes that were in China and connected those to other empires who also had their own existing roads uh, and trade routes. So what he essentially did was link up with this entire network of trade routes throughout the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, and so we're gonna get this huge uh, network of trade paths uh, that are gonna cover about 4,000 miles from China all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. Now, this was not a walk in the park. These roads were not paved. Uh, we don't have any of those things going on. Uh, there's not fast food along the way or anything like that. These are very challenging, dangerous trade routes. Uh, they're going to go through deserts and mountains uh, and things like that. Um, so the Silk Road began in the city of Chang'an in China and went all the way to the city of Antioch in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. Um, and what they would do was once they got to Antioch, they would ship goods all throughout the Mediterranean basin, all the way to Rome and parts of North Africa, uh, Greece, and so on. Uh, and so those goods were able to travel really far. Now we don't have just overland routes. We also have sea routes that are connected to the Silk Road as well. And these are connect, gonna connect India, Persia, Mesopotamia, Arabia, and uh, Africa as well. So we're gonna take a look at these maps here. So you can see on here, we have the city of Chang'an, which is where the Silk Road's going to begin. Uh, it's gonna veer up here to the Northwest. We're gonna go through the Co Do uh, sorry, Gobi Desert. Um, and we're gonna go through the Taklamakan Desert. And if you remember uh, the Taklamakan Desert, remember it translated into, if you go in, you will not come out. Uh, so really dangerous pathway here. Uh, we would go through the Pamir Mountains as well, and then through Persia all the way to Antioch in Asia Minor. You can see Antioch is located right on the coast of the Mediterranean, which is going to be our ju jumping off point for trading goods all throughout the Mediterranean basin. Okay, And then this is a more extensive map of the Silk Road. So you can see we're not just going to the northwest. We have these little southern offshoots that are going to connect other areas of Asia. Uh, we're connecting to India here, uh, and we have some other land routes here through Egypt and so on. And these are all going to connect to our routes in uh, the water. So we've got the South China Sea. We're going to have trade throughout Southeast Asia. We've got things coming from India throughout the Indian Ocean Basin, going all the way up here to the Mediterranean, where we're trading with Constantinople and Greece and Rome and then down the coast, the east coast of Africa here. So this is essentially connecting the entire Eastern hemisphere, uh, if we don't count like Australia down here and so on. Okay. Now, traveling the Silk Road did not mean that you were traveling from Chang'an all the way to Antioch yourself. Very few travelers journeyed the entire length. Uh, probably the most famous person to travel uh, the length of it was Marco Polo, um, but usually goods would be passed from trader to trader. So we can click back to our map here. I might start here in Lanzhou, and I might just go up here to Turpin. I'm not going to go all the way to Baghdad with my stuff. Um, so I'm going to meet up with different traders at these rendezvous points, these different trading uh, hubs, and they're going to trade with me. We're going to buy and sell goods, and then they're going to take them on to wherever I'm going to take my goods back, and so on. 
So you're just going to travel a, a short leg of the journey. Um, and the further those goods go, the higher the price gets. So if I want silk in Rome, I'm going to pay uh, a pretty hefty price for that silk because it's coming all the way from China. And each person who trades it is going to have to trade it for more and more money uh, in order to, uh, to make it worth their while. So silk is going to be very, very valuable. Um, it's originally made in China um, and it's developed by Han farmers who are raising silkworms. And silkworms are kind of like a caterpillar. Um, they are going to produce the fibers for the silk. It's then going to be woven and dyed into the material that we know as silk. Now, silk production is very secret. Uh, a lot of people who were producing silk in China didn't know how to make it from start to finish. You had some people who were just in charge of the silkworms and harvesting the silk. You had other people who only knew how to cut and dye the silk. You had other people who were in charge of weaving the silk. And so uh, that helped protect the secret because if you revealed the secret to anyone outside of China, the penalty was death. And one of the reasons for that is we're making a lot of money off of silk. And so if people in Rome are paying a really high price for our silk here in China, I don't want Rome to discover how to make their own silk because then they're not going to buy it from us and we would lose that monopoly on the silk trade. And so China really wanted to protect that, to protect their economy and their industry. Um, and the Romans value it very highly. It's a pretty strong material. Um, it was even used for writing on, uh, and it's very fashionable in Rome during this time. Now, silk is not the only good that's being traded along the Silk Road. We also have spices coming from India. Uh, so China and India are trading silk and spices. Uh, from Central Asia, they are trading horses and jade. And from Rome, they're producing glass, perfumes, jewelry, and different types of uh, linens and materials that are going to be traded as well. So the Silk Road is not just about silk, uh, but it's named after silk because it was such, a, uh, such an expensive and highly sought after good. Now, goods are not the only thing being traded on the Silk Road either. We also have cultural exchanges happening. Um, missionaries would travel along the Silk Road uh, and missionaries were coming up from India to China and spreading Buddhism. When we talked about Buddhism previously in our class, uh, we learned that Buddhism kind of dies out as the major religion in India and it spreads to China where it then becomes the major religion in China. Uh, Hinduism will remain the, the big religion in India for several years until Islam is uh, introduced. Um, but Hinduism and Buddhism also spread to Southeast Asia. We looked at those other trade routes uh, that are going to bring um, bring the religions there. Um, and it's not just missionaries spreading Buddhism. They're also, um, you know, if I'm just a trader and I practice Buddhism or I practice Hinduism, uh, I might get to talking to someone about my religious beliefs and ideas can, tra can uh, be spread that way as well. Uh, and then we haven't really talked much about Christianity just yet, but Christianity is going to be another big religion that spreads on the Silk Road. Uh, it spreads throughout the Roman Empire, Mesopotamia, and Persia, and even comes to China eventually uh, under the Mongols uh, that will come into power later on. Um, so this picture right here is a, uh, a giant statue of Buddha that is in China. So kind of just demonstrating uh, the prevalence of Buddhism uh, in China, especially in the Tibet region. All right. Um, and it's not just religion that are cultural exchanges. You get foods that are spreading, different ways of making foods, different ways of making goods. Uh, all kinds of different cultural exchanges are happening on the Silk Road. And then we also have biological exchanges. Um, so just like we're seeing right now with the spread of the coronavirus, one of the first things that a lot of countries did when it hit their country was to shut down travel. Uh, that was one of the first things our country did uh, in the United States. Um, and the reason for that is when people are traveling around and intermixing, uh, disease can spread really quickly. And we see that on the Silk Road as well. So Rome and China are going to be dealing with smallpox, measles, and the bubonic plague, which is sometimes called the Black Death. 
Um, the Roman Empire drops in their population 25% from the first century to the 10th century. And China's population also drops about 25% from the first to the seventh century. And we're in the common era now. Um, so these diseases have a pretty big impact on the populations of those areas as well. Okay. Now we also have some other major achievements coming from China related to tradition and learning. Uh, if you remember the Qin emperors were not real keen on Confucianism. Uh, they had destroyed a lot of books, histories of China, uh, and they emphasized legalism. Um, but when the Han rulers come along, they start encouraging Confucianism. They wanted people in their government to have a knowledge of Confucian teachings. They emphasized education, uh, which is part of what Confucianism is all about. And they required their government officials to take a civil service examination. So instead of promoting people to positions of power in the government, based on maybe who their dad was or their family background, they were promoted based on merit. So are you smart enough? Do you have the qualifications to do the job well? Um, and that's what the civil service examination was testing. And if you passed, you were given a government position. And so, um, so that's going to help maintain stability in the Han di dynasty. And one of the things that helps them stay in power for so long. We also have uh, the arts and scholarship, which flourishes. Uh, people are making all kinds of different pottery. Uh, a dictionary is developed for the Chinese language, which is uh, pretty great at this time. And then we also have the resurgence of historical knowledge. A lot of people previously in China had very little knowledge of their history. They depended on myths, which can be you know, true or false. Uh, there were lots of conflicting stories that didn't corroborate one another. And they had little knowledge of their political background with different emperors. And like I said before, the Qin dynasty also had destroyed a lot of uh, history that had been written down previously. So a man named Sima Qian uh, spends his life writing the history of China. He's trying to remedy this. And he goes from uh, mythical times all the way to the reign of Han Wudi. Uh, and he writes it all down in what is called the historical records, which is a pretty straightforward name, not too creative. Um, but he is responsible for um, this resurgence of historical knowledge and, and educating people about the history of China. And of course, later emperors and, and people in China will depend on those histories uh, as they go forward. Right. The Han are also responsible for the spread of a lot of technology. We said that the Han dynasty was pretty stable. They had a stable economy. Um, they had a stable government. Um, and that stability allows improvements to happen in society. Um, if you have high unemployment, if you have rebellions happening all the time, if you've got wars breaking out all over the empire, people are going to be more concerned with survival than they are with making any improvements to society. And so if you've got a stable empire, then your society tends to focus on other things like making things better uh, for everyone else. So we've got a couple of different technologies that come out of China at this time. The iron plow, which is used for farming. They invent the rudder, which is used to steer ships. Uh, they develop a seismoscope, which helps register uh, earthquakes when they happen. And then eventually that will develop into uh, the Richter scale, where you can actually measure the strength of earthquakes. They also invent the compass, which is going to be huge for our era of exploration uh, that will come later on and the wheelbarrow as well. And one of the major technologies that comes out of the Han Dynasty is the development of paper, uh, which happens around 105 CE. Um, paper was originally, um, or they didn't originally use paper, they wrote on bones, uh, on bark, um, on silk sometimes. Um, but the paper is going to be uh, used for creating books, uh, keeping records of things. It's going to be really important. We'll eventually see currency move to paper money. Um, so this technology is going to spread all throughout the world, uh, and it's going to have a major impact on learning and the arts. And so what they would do is they would take either tree bark or hemp or old rags, beat them down into a pulp, a wet pulp that they would soak, and then dry it on flat screens, which you can see kind of happening here uh, in this picture. And then that paper would be uh, pulled up and cut into various sizes and then used to write things down. And like I said, uh, it spread all over the world. Uh, people stopped using things like papyrus, like you saw in Egypt, and converting to keeping records on paper. 
A couple of other achievements that we have is bronze working architecture. Uh, we get a lot of the traditional Chinese architecture that we probably recognize um, from this period. A lot of poetry is written down uh, and jade carving as well. And all of this contributes to, uh, to the arts in ancient China. Then we also see some developments in medicine, uh, the development of acupuncture, which takes little tiny needles and uses it to treat diseases. They put the needles into your skin at different pressure points uh, that help to promote healing throughout your body. Uh, they also used a lot of herbal remedies, and they discovered the circulatory system, uh, that blood travels throughout the body uh, and moves in different ways. Um, and so that's really going to help with the development of medical knowledge uh, of the human body that will help uh, future advancements. Okay, so that is all we have for achievements in ancient China. Uh, make sure you go back and take a look at these notes for review, and I'll see you next time.